Hello again. Welcome back to the Moon Buff Reactions channel. Today we're going to be looking at the latest video put out by the Unusual Suspect, an old favorite of this channel. And today's particular video, continuing his trend of covering various movies in one go, he's going to be looking at the Lord of the Rings adaptations that came before the Peter Jackson trilogy. And I'm really interested to see this because he's covered the Peter Jackson movies many years ago and they were pretty amazing reviews and I'm very familiar with Lord of the Rings. I grew up watching the movies and I come from a family of a uh, pretty big J.R. Tolkien fans and he said in a tease video that he would be covering a total of eight pre Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies, which is pretty uh, interested to hear because I am a little familiar with some of the movies that came before, mostly the animated ones. Um, before I even saw the Peter Jackson movies, I grew up pretty heavily with the uh, animated Hobbit and Return of the King movies on this uh, double VHS set. <laughs> and I think sometime around middle school, I got my hands on the Ralph Bakshi animated Lord of the Rings, which is a uh, pretty trippy, but definitely um, interesting to watch, especially if you're mostly familiar with the more later version. And I don't, I didn't know about the other versions, so again, I'm really fascinated to see what they are and how exactly uh, they compare. And without further uh, ramblings, let's jump in and see what the old school Lord of the Rings were like and what Ross has to say about them. So I don't think enough people realize just how miraculous the Lord of the Rings trilogy is. You know, considering who directed it and the kind of things this man was known for. Pretty good. <laughs> Meet the Feebles. Studio executives at New Line Cinema gave the man who made this half a billion dollars in today's money to adapt <laughs> one of the greatest literary classics of all time. Only in our messed up reality did that turn out to be a good decision. Hey, <laughs> don't don't hate on me for feebles. The most decorated director Bad taste and all time the Frighteners probably played a hand as well. It shocked me just how brilliant these films are. Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy is a beautifully shot, well-acted, brilliantly scored, cinematic masterpiece. There haven't been anything like it, and there hasn't been anything like it since. And if Tolkien had been around to see Jackson's magnum opus, I can only imagine how bloody blown his mind would have been. But speaking of Tolkien, his original Lord of the Rings novels were written way back in the 50s, and The Hobbit goes as far back as 1937. And with Fellowship of the Ring hitting theatres in 2001, one, that 64 years it took to finally adapt Tolkien's works to the big screen. Except, that's a complete lie. It took way less than that. You think Peter Jackson's trilogy were the first Lord of the Rings movies? Uh, obviously not. Ralph Bakshi did one. Everyone knows that. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, how many of these were there? Eight. Eight? Eight. Yeah, Peter Jackson's trilogy was actually the ninth on-screen adaptation of Tolkien's books. How oddly thematic. And believe it or not, there was actually supposed to be even more. You see, mm -hmm. the idea of a Lord of the Rings movie goes as far back as the books themselves. Because the first well, of course. customer was a man Tolkien notoriously didn't like. Walt Disney, and he was considering making <laughs> of a an adaptation way back in the 50s. But storyboard artists thought it was a bit too long for an animated film, and also they thought the subject might have wasn't really kid-friendly enough for the Disney brand, so they shelved the idea. Then, during the heights of Beatlemania, oh, no. the Fab Four themselves were on a three-picture deal with United Artists. They'd already done two of the three films, and seemingly high off their asses, they actually considered doing a Lord of the Rings themed Good film. fucking Grief. Now, it didn't go through. In fact, the project never even really got started. Apparently, they spent a lot of time arguing who would play who, with them eventually deciding that Paul would be Frodo, Ringo would be Sam, George would be Gandalf, and John was gonna play Gollum. I want to repeat <laughs> that. John Lennon as Gollum. Won't you stay for me? <laughs> and 
you think that's bad? Whoa. Go to the seventies where British director I see Robert that Robert was set to direct a three hour movie adaptation, which also got cancelled. And when you read about what he was planning, you were very glad it did. From how in the script, Sauron was described as looking like Mick Jagger. Freaking Al Pacino was considered to play Frodo. And despite how fantasy well, was seen as mostly sure. a kids thing back then, they, for some reason, wanted to spruce up the sex factor big time. With how weirdly horny the whole fellowship gets for Galadriel, with Frodo and her even getting it on. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Whoa. with Aragorn <laughs> healing Eowyn by... I mean, just read this. And, and take into account, Eowyn is dying here. Aragorn summons all his strength and grasps Eowyn's body tightly. Aragorn spreads out her arms and covers her with his body. After a moment, she moans and her body writhes. Aragorn grasps her and kisses her with passion and intensity. Am I reading Lord of the Rings? Interesting of version of the Heimlich Maneuver. But all those adaptations never happened, thank fuck. So what actually did... <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's It'd go be... I, I'd pay money to see those. And trilogy Just a curiosity. <laughs> so what was the first ever on-screen adaptation of Tolkien's works? Well, it was an absolute fucking disaster. Come Guys, on, let me do tell. Let to you a man called William L. Snyder, who, in 1961, nabbed himself the rights to adapt The Hobbit into an animated film, and his contract stipulated he had to release this film within five years. So, he commissioned a cartoonist called Gene Deitch to write a script, and 20th Century Fox were set to distribute, and so they decided not to. I don't care anymore. And it was bad <laughs> timing as the five-year lease was almost up. If Snyder didn't make this film, he was going to lose the rights. But like the Spider-Man franchise. Don't pout. Don't sob. Just do a half-assed job. <laughs> And that is precisely what he did. For Snyder and Deitch got to work and quickly put together this hunk of shit. 1967's The Hobbit, the, regrettably, first official on-screen adaptation of Tolkien's work. A crudely animated what? narrated storyboard the ever of images, loving which came out fuck. just 12 minutes in length. But wait a minute, I hear you say. Didn't the contract state that he had to make a movie? Well, yeah. But the contract didn't specify a runtime. Loopholes. But they had to release this quote-unquote movie. They had to prove that people saw it. So, you know what they did? They exhibited it for one time only in New York City. And they literally went out onto the streets of Manhattan and asked passers-by if they had 12 minutes spare to watch it. And to rope them in, they even gave them the admission money to get in. All they asked in return was for them to sign a document stating they paid money to see the film. Jesus Christ! Held onto the rights, which he later sold this is the to desperation the to a new level. $900,000 in today's money. You devious son of a bitch. And I do not need to tell you that the short is terrible. I mean, the Hobbit trilogy that we all know gets a lot of flack for stretching one book into a trilogy of films. But this bloody thing tells the whole story in about the same time it takes for me to boil an egg. It is diabolically bad. And what do you expect when it was designed by a guy called... Uh, oh. Oh my god, it's Hitler! And for whatever reason, despite... <laughs> That's the an unfortunate name. ...of this was, they for some reason took the time to change a lot of the characters' names. Instead of Gollum, it's Gollum. Maybe they thought it'd be sexier. Instead of trolls, they're called Gromes. The legends say that Gromes must be in their caves before sunrise, or they'll surely turn into dry trees, rooted to the ground forever. Good move. Instead of Smaug, the dragon is called by the monster lizard Slag the Terrible. I I'm sorry, the dragon is called what? Slag. Well, he hoards a bunch of gold and destroyed the lives of many men. I guess he is a bit of a slag. <laughs> and speaking of slags, for some reason they created a brand new character called Princess Mika, who ends up... Gotta appeal to the female demographic. Mika and Mika reigned there together. But finally they returned to that quiet, comfortable life in Hobbiton. You know, it's kind of weird for me to say this, but I actually think giving Bilbo a love interest in the Hobbit trilogy would have 
unironically been a good move. With Mika here being a princess of the Lonely Mountain, it would have given Bilbo more of a connection to Erebor, I think. I always felt that Bilbo had nothing relevant to do in the last film. A love interest could have offered something. Certainly would have made more sense to give our hero a love interest. You know, Maybe. As opposed to giving one to one of the billion side characters. Okay, I'll yeah, they did that. Else to talk about with this one, so let's move on. And allow me to set the scene with this one by talking about the Lord of the Rings overlooked but strong connection to music. Yeah, I mean, there was the short-lived Lord of the Rings musical in the West End, there was the aforementioned Beatles connection, and many real-world musicians sang songs about Tolkien's works. Seems like every musician threw in references to Lord of the Rings. Led Zeppelin, Enya, Black Sabbath, Leonard Nimoy, Rush... <laughs> Let it be, boy. Yep, I know this. The 60s, man. But another Fucking 60s. Was by the works of Tolkien was a Swedish guy called Bo Hansen, who recorded an entire instrumental progressive rock concept album in 1969, with the tracks all being based on moments from Tolkien's book. And this album was quite successful. It got certified gold in the UK and reached the top 40 here. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, this album served as the inspiration for the very first live action adaptation of The Lord of the Rings. But when I say live action... That's a stretch. I use that term very loosely. Yeah, this is Sagan om Ringen. And I've definitely butchered that. In English, it's called The Saga of the Ring. And it was a made-for-TV special produced by Sweden's national broadcaster, SBT, which aired way back in 1971. And yes, it is as terrible as it looks. It has the production value of a high school play with cheap costumes, god-awful blue screen, and not even any character dialogue. All it is is a retelling of the events leading up to the Council of Elrond, narrated ad nauseum by a guy whose only wish is to dump on you a mountain of exposition. Gandalf ik först. Sen Did Stephen King adapt this? Feels like one of his adaptations. <laughs> Just look at the character designs. Frodo appears to be a woman. Sam looks like a court jester. Not surprising. Gandalf looks like Leonardo da Vinci. Gimli looks like Robin Hood. And the One Ring looks like a goddamn donut. I mean, it is sort of interesting to well, watch. Like a cock ring. It does differ in what it adapts. Like that there is Tom Bombadil. And the elf sent to help Frodo is not Arwen. It's Glorfindel, like he does in the books. And Sagan Omrinjen is actually the only Lord of the Rings adaptation that includes this character. Every other version either substitutes him for another elf, like Arwen or Legolas, or they just omit him altogether, and Frodo takes himself to Rivendell. But yeah, That's this interesting. is definitely a relic of his time. This is also on YouTube for anyone curious, and credit to YouTuber Pengi, who translated this for the world to see. But let's move on to actual feature-length adaptations. And the first one of those was a made-for-TV special, produced by Rankin Bass, yeah. mostly for their stop motion work. I'm sure a lot of Americans will recognize their Christmas specials, but in 1977 they collaborated with a Japanese yeah. animation studio called Topcraft to produce an adaptation of The Hobbit. Topcraft, by the way, went bankrupt eight years later, and its assets got bought up by this guy. So yeah, this huh. version of The Hobbit, you could argue, is an early Studio Ghibli production. Totally. Bit of a stretch. Kind of. Sort of. Not really. But still, that must mean the film is fairly decent, right? Well, honestly, I just found it fine. I mean, with the Peter Jackson well, Hobbit trilogy... Well, I'm a little biased, by, but I really like it. Personally, I do like those films. This version comes across as pretty rushed. It's only about an hour 17 long, and yes, it tells the whole story of The Hobbit. It's a lot to tell in that amount of time, and as such, the film is plagued with a lot of exposition. With the only scenes that are given room to breathe are Bilbo's encounter with Gollum, who in this version looks more like a frog, and I dare say is even more unhinged than Circus. <laughs> <laughs> this guy needs a snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> and then there's Bilbo's encounter with Smaug, who for some reason has had car headlights inserted into his eyeballs. This, the adventure you've planned for me? To help you recapture the gold? None other. <laughs> oh, that reminds me, I need to sort out those... Yeah, there's a weird moment. Ages. 
So yeah, the film wastes no time. They come across the trolls, all the dwarves get caught off screen. They get caught by the elves, Bilbo frees them in a jump cut. The men, elves and dwarves are about to go to war with each other, the goblin army approaches, and the three kings have the quickest turnaround of character imaginable. Oh no, we're king under the mountain. Well, what else were they gonna do? Brothers and to my Brothers who literally 20 seconds ago I was willing to slaughter in their thousands. It is interesting though to see how this differs from the Jackson version. Like how Elrond is rocking a halo for some reason. And how the goblins are both less and more frightening at the same time. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> Yeah, that freaked me out as a kid. <laughs> oh, and the Arkenstone doesn't exist in this version. So when they ask Bilbo to risk his life by heading into Smaug's lair, what does he eventually come back with? This. A cup. Speaking of Bilbo, you might honestly find him kind of annoying in this. Now, I wasn't bothered by him personally, but he has a very whimsical and overly dramatic way of speaking. That a little, but didn't it didn't bug me. Simply enchanting. I don't know how to thank you. Bless my soul. But I'd appreciate a more pragmatic salute. Can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, I say. Splendid. Oh, voice you acting in Rankin Bass is a little so iffy. Fellow. I say, my way of speaking is simply enchanting. I'm so posh, I use an unopened bottle of Dom Perignon as my dildo. <laughs> He's a little overbearing. Oh, and this version of The Hobbit features a lot of songs. And it seems like literally every time... Be careful how you talk on them. ...one starts playing. And this happens a lot. It gets so old. The greatest I have no complaints about the music. Respectfully yeah, this disagree. Super special is serviceable. If you're a die-hard Tolkien nut, maybe watch this. But for most of you, you're not missing much if you skip it. But should you skip that other Lord of the Rings adaptation that mostly everyone knows about? Yeah, let's talk about Ralph Bakshi's version. So mm. Bakshi's Lord of the Rings came out just one year after the Rankin Bass version of The Hobbit, and instead of traditional animation, this is rotoscoped, which if you mm. didn't know, is where you film real-life footage and trace over it frame by frame. Now, rotoscope a bit cheating. can look fantastic. Many classic Disney films were done this way, but here... It doesn't quite work for me. And I think the best reason for this is because rotoscoping is best used to animate bodies. Not so much faces. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what Bakshi has done here. His animators seem to have used the actor's expressions. Yeah, it can be a little nauseating. It works, but often it doesn't. It's like I'm walking on sunshine! Seriously, I found myself unintentionally laughing a lot at this picture. Mostly because the animation style reminded me of... Ganon and his minions have seized the island of Corridite. Yeah, I mean, it's not that bad, but that is what I was reminded of. I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok. Hmm. Oh, and just look at Frodo's face here. Look. Ah, <laughs> what the hell happened to his eyes? <laughs> Well, he gets the same. I hate to knock it. Rotoscoping sounds like a major pain in the ass to do, but it seems like to cut costs, many scenes are just regular films. Yeah, this looks it's fucked up. Like blend those in a little. They just put a lot of black smudges on them. It's not a good look. And speaking of not good looks, check out even more of the faces they pull in this. <laughs> <laughs> He makes you look retarded. Alfie didn't catch on as some kind of meme. It's too good. Okay, animation aside, how's the actual movie? Because it does have a cult following. A lot of people sing its praises. And, yeah, I see the appeal. It's got a unique and interesting vibe to it. It's very well voice acted with the likes of John Hurt as Aragon. And I still can't get over how that's 3PO voicing Legolas. On the gates of your most wondrous ancient kingdom, you write, Speak for yeah. the Inventor. 
And more you know. In any language can open the door. So yeah, Bakshi's Lord of the Rings is definitely the best adaptation I'm talking about today. Though don't be fooled, it has issues up the ass. Because this is only a two hour adaptation of both The Fellowship of the Ring and The Two Towers, it does feel pretty rushed. Not as rushed as the Rankin Bass version. There are some scenes... Uh, I again, respectfully disagree. ...characters breathe a little. But many scenes they try to are cramp like so much in. ...to hit that two hour runtime, with the events of The Two Towers going by very quickly quickly and so much is explained insultingly fast like here Mary and Pippin join Frodo and Sam on their journey off screen and Mary and Pippin insisted on coming with us as far as Green seriously this is how we're introduced to them and speaking of Mary and Pippin check out this bizarre edit when they first meet Treebeard that's a commonly kind of and the orcs made us run all the way here, and when we could run any yeah. carriages, and cut our rope, ran into the forest, and we came Wait, 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 time out. You have just been picked up by a moving, talking tree. Aren't you at least a little weirded out about that? It's talking, Mary. The tree is talking. Yeah, like that. Thank you, Billy. And the pacing is really off in some parts. Like the Rahiram attack on the Uryx that took Merry and Pippin. That scene is given way too much screen time here. Where for some reason, they don't even want to attack each other. Oh, thank No shooting. Those guys aren't even moving on the left. I don't get it. Oh, and Frodo was on Asphaloth. For some reason, the ring race and him just sort of look at each other for like two and a half minutes of screen time. Very trippy. Like, oh yeah, maybe I should, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many other things I don't like, from how they turned Sam into a bumbling idiot. They turned into a special needs so patient. They seemingly decide on whether to call him Saruman or... Aruman? Aruman, Saruman. Yeah. Saruman, Aruman, Saruman. This is weird. Aruman. Look, I don't mind you calling him Aruman if you want. Just pick a name and stick to it. You're not Prince. And then there's the downright confusing edits. Like, check out this scene where they're talking about Lothlorien after escaping the Balrog. Lothlorien is a place of healing. There is no evil in it, unless a man brings evil there with him. Welcome to Lothlorien. That was quick. You know, if we could have just arrived here with a jump cut, why did we bother with Moria? <clears throat> and it goes on. Mary and Pippin have no personality. The Nazgul look like tall Jowers. Saruman and Theoden look like Santa. And Gandalf, as it turns out, is a closet Nazi. Hi, Hitler. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> so if there is one thing I really like about this version, it's Frodo. He is much more proactive than Elijah Wood. Agreed. Was, with Wood's version often letting other characters pick up the slack for him. The Hobbit has shown extraordinary resilience to its evil. Really? The guy who dropped his sword fell over. Yeah, and let that's else one ride big him flaw with Jackson. That guy's resilient. No, this guy is resilient. By all the Shire, you shall have neither the ring nor me. You always oh, dying. Is Frodo such a badass. I like this guy. There's a couple other things I like too. Like when Gandalf fights the Balrog, the Fellowship actually attempts to Yeah! Him. Yeah! Him just awkwardly gawking at him. And at Weathertop, Aragorn doesn't leave the Hobbit's side. He's always with them in this version. That makes more sense. Like, where the hell does he even go in the Jackson film? I'm gonna take a piss. That was a fun joke in the original reveal. Things here this version does better. But don't misunderstand, Bakshi's version doesn't hold a candle to the 2000s trilogy. It's okay though, yep. if you do like the rotoscoped look, and are too turned off by Gandalf's fuck me eyes, uh, I actually really dig this. And look, I might that's say gonna keep me up at night. It, just more often for the wrong reason. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. <laughs> this is a very ditzy Gandalf. Was the spin really necessary? You spin okay, me round. One of Bakshi's films. How was his version of Return of the King? <clears throat> huh? Yeah, Bakshi never did Return of the King. It ends with the victory at Helm's Deep, and uh, that's that. The end. Wait, wait, what, what happened? What happens next? Come on, let's see. Yeah, that pissed me off. That's it. What? 
And it's weird the sequel never happened, because contrary to popular belief, the film was actually financially successful, grossing $30.5 million on an estimated budget of 4 to $12 million. But the fan response was muted, and Bakshi went on to call the production of this movie the worst experience of his life. Well, there's that. So uh, I guess that would explain why part two never got made. <sighs> okay, well, what's next then? Wait. Did somebody else make Return of the King? Well, well they yeah. might as well this is complete. Because this is not a Ralph Bakshi production. It's another ranking Bass one. Yeah, the 1977 version of The Hobbit got a sequel, but they decided to skip the entire events of Fellowship and Two Towers and cut straight to Return of the King. Well, Bakshi already did it. What? Well, when Rankin was asked about why he skipped straight to the third book as opposed to telling the story of the whole trilogy, he said, I didn't know that the audience would sit still for it. <laughs> I was wrong. Yeah, yeah, he was wrong, all right. I mean, I was so confused how this film could even exist. How on earth can you skip Fellowship and Two Towers? Well, here's how. This movie weirdly begins after Honestly, as a little kid, as the I didn't have a problem following it. Elrond are chilling in Rivendell, where they talk about the events of Return of the King. Then it flashbacks to tell the story, starting from the moment when Sam enters Kirith Ungol. Random as hell place to start? Because yeah, not only are the entire events of the first two books skipped, the encounter with Shelob is skipped too. And as a result, this film is a bloody mess. There is so much exposition to try to catch you all up. And if you weren't already familiar with the story, this would make zero sense. I mean, granted, there are I some followed it pretty fine. adapted here that the Jackson film didn't show, which actually makes for interesting viewing today. Like how Denethor uses a Palantir in this one. And I think this shouldn't have been cut from the Jackson version. If you ask me, this would have helped better demonstrate why he goes mad. But at least Agreed. John Paul didn't laugh like this. <laughs> <laughs> also, another power of the ring is shown here, where holding it could sometimes make you appear more intimidating. Like that scene where Sam takes on those orcs in Jackson's version. Well, in the books, and in this version... He doesn't fight them. They actually just run away from him, as the One Ring makes Sam appear more menacing. It's interesting to see how they changed it for Sean Astin's scene, because instead of the Ring making him appear more menacing, him growling in the shadows does that. Then they flip it on his head when he reveals himself. As for Gollum, his death is handled differently too, because in the Peter Jackson version, Frodo and him struggle, which leads to him falling off the cliff. But in this version, he just trips on his own. <laughs> has completed our quest. Thank God we didn't have to. Now, I have heard <laughs> an argument in favour of this ending because some people say that it was the ring that caused him to trip because he swore to protect Frodo on the ring itself. The ring is treacherous. It will hold you to your word. So when he breaks that vow, the ring causes his demise. Kind of similar, I guess, to what happened to Azildar. It betrays him. But this also causes the ring itself to be destroyed. And I don't think it would want that, because it's trying to get back to its master, right? So, All fair. Uh, I still prefer Jackson's version of this scene. There's also several other changes, but none are for the better. Like, you see these statues in Jackson's version? Well, those play a more pivotal role in the book, and this version adapts that, as they project an invisible barrier, which Sam uses the vial of Galadriel to pass. But because we never see Galadriel give Frodo the vial in this one, this just comes across as a bit too convenient. How do I get past this? Oh, uh, it's a magic item. Nothing more said than that. That was easy. Oh, but then there's Theoden's death, which is pretty violent and quite effectively shocking in the 2003 film. But here, what kills him? Darkness. Seriously, a bit of shade spooks his horse and he falls off and he dies. Hear me! Hear me, oh darkness! <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I will avenge my lord! Curse you, darkness! I will leave my porch lights on overnight just to Okay, I can see. Me. It's so a little drink. silly. Well, where the hell is the witch king then? <laughs> oh, there he is. Leave the dead in peace. Come back between the magical... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? That's what the witch king sounds like? I mean... 
I can't be the only one who's thinking of somebody else here. And by the way, do you know the way back to Castle Grayskull? Or I, best I didn't see it when I was little, demon. but I see it now. It's weird that this is called Return of the King, because Aragorn is barely in it. Though given how his voice actor reads his lines, maybe that's for the better. We shall see. Nice reading, Ben. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. So yeah, most someone yanking on his nutsack. Frodo, which gets old fast for two reasons. One is that they never stop fucking mourning. Not an inch. Well, at this point in the story, the do you blame them? Fail. Just give me a moment. It is a long time, Mr. Frodo. You can't manage the weight of Matches Frodo's lost. personality in general. Going to die. This is the end of ends. Oh my God, mourning Myrtle moans less than you. And the second issue, less can Oh, come on. Don't hate on these songs. songs. make a comeback. And look, it's hard for me to demonstrate just how effing often these songs start playing. And it gets especially bad when they say a line. Still, Sam, we shall have to try. And then they use that line as the subject matter for a song. It's so easy not to try. There's still such a long way to go. That's tomorrow, Mr. Frodo. Tomorrow. If they start singing about tomorrow, I'm gonna shoot myself. Leave tomorrow. It's a nice song. <laughs> You're lost. But speaking of songs, there is one that I've had stuck in my head for several days. Oh yeah. There's a whip. There's a way. Where there's a whip. There's a way. Is that whip sound timed perfectly on the beat that makes my head bop? Where there's a whip, there's a way. Where there's a whip, there's a way. But yeah, this film is just weird. It's all over the place, spending way too much time on irrelevant things and glossing over very important things. And the dialogue can get very, 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 very odd. You. Oh, I can feel you throbbing with excitement. <laughs> I think Sam wants to fuck the ring. Okay, I never fine. heard that before What's that it? way. But now you said. The hell? The fabulous journey of Mr. Bilbo Baggins, the Hobbit, across the wildland, through the dark forest, beyond the Misty Mountains, there and back again. Roll straight off the tongue. Okay, so I'm just going to call this... The Hobbit, for it's another adaptation of Tolkien's first book. And this is a children's television play, which aired in 1985 in the Soviet Union. And whilst it is better than the Swedish teleplay, there is still not really any reason to watch this. I mean, it is somewhat interesting that Russian Abe Vigoda here is playing Tolkien himself, as the special cuts between him and the play as he retells the story of The Hobbit. But it's paced horribly, skipping many Is this the Russian Hobbit? Like Elrond is an I've never this, seen it, but I've heard of it. With the trolls as an ear either, and there are so many design choices which are just odd. Like Bilbo is wearing pink in this for some reason. The dwarves are all well, he is like fabulous. Rangers and Gandalf. I mean, just look at him. Я пошлю вас участвовать в моем приключении. Меня это развлечет, а для вас будет. I'm honestly kind of freaked out by this Gary guy. Glitter There's much? About the way he stares, which is just unsettling. Oh, and it doesn't help that the dude never stops laughing. <laughs> so this is what it would be like if Gandalf took the ring. <laughs> Perspective change with the dwarves is also weird. Sometimes they try to make them look smaller, to horrendous effects, might I add. <laughs> and other times, Gandalf is the same exact size of them. Consistency? What's that? But the chair midget here, the midget there, there, midgets everywhere. The music numbers. Yeah, there's songs and dances in this, because apparently they wrote in ballerinas from a theater in St. Petersburg. And these guys portray the people of Lake Town and do a song and dance number there. Praise Russia. <laughs> Some of the music here is quite nice. The oh, this music you'll like? No right being so good. Well, 
if you like it, fine. For me, I'm a rankin' bass dude. I think that's really pleasant. It's a lovely melody. But the songs can still accompany some exceptionally odd moments. Like, check out this scene where Bilbo and the dwarves are sleeping in the cave and are ambushed by the <coughs> goblins. That's a goblin. Talking about sex or drugs? These are the goblins? I don't get it. They're just humans. Like, did you run out of makeup or something? Put them in green face paints at least. Are you even trying? But well, jeez, with our crappy budget, how the hell do we do Gollum? Okay, here's what we do. We cover him in green face paint, cover his whole body in webs, put two thick teeth in his gob, and then adorn his head with a green colored ball cap with fish fins. This world you can cheat. This is the world you can oh, try it. This no. world you can cheat. This world of love with it. What's a digital eat your heart out? Oh, and it doesn't help that this scene of Bilbo and Gollum exchanging riddles goes on for over 10 minutes, which in a special that's just over an hour long is a lot. And with talks of the small-ass budget nature of this, you might be wondering, how did they go about recreating Smaug? My <laughs> yeah, Smaug is on loan from Mattel, it would seem. Action figures each sold separately. I mean, there's something kind of well, charming about this, actually. It's like the Be Kind Rewind of The Hobbit. You have to admire something that's so phenomenal. It's not like the Godzilla and movies look any better. Some online admiration for this play, for I found a lot of YouTubers who like to add their own fake subtitles for shits and giggles. Alright, I had to give it a go. <laughs> So if you're willing to have some fun taking the piss out of this one, maybe check it out. Maybe I will. Otherwise, definitely skip it. And you know what else? You should also skip the other Soviet-produced Tolkien television. Two Russian hobbits? Two of them. Yep, this other one, titled Guardians in English, is a Lord of the Rings retelling, which came out six years later in 1991. So yeah, just as the Soviet Union was collapsing. And would you believe me when I say that this version is even worse? Like, much worse. I mean, the 1985 teleplay had a weird charm to it, but oh my effing lord, this was horrible to sit through. Abandon all hope, he who dare to watch this shit. It's a bizarre retelling of Fellowship of the Ring, with horrendous production, god-awful acting, and the most confusing direction imaginable. Like, watch this scene where Gandalf the Purple here greets Bilbo at his birthday party. <laughs> Confused? Yeah. Welcome to the party, pal! <laughs> it took me forever to figure out those are actually Gandalf's fireworks. I thought he was just showing off his red really? look. Really? Or how about this scene where Bilbo is about to give the ring to Gandalf? Okay, we need to demonstrate the power of the ring and the sway it still holds on Bilbo. I've got it. We play a shitty-ass 80s music beat and have Gandalf make shadow puppets with his hands. Look, you think I'm joking? Watch. <laughs> Sounds like the Shaft theme. I am losing my mind. Help me. <laughs> what is with Frodo in this? First of all, he looks like the forbidden love child of Johnny Rotten and Mr. Bean. And it seems it looks like, like a lesbian crackhead. Reading his lines as bizarrely as possible. This guy must have been on some kind of illegal substance. Surely. I wouldn't put it past him. Here remind me less of Frodo and Sam and more of Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> Why did you do that? 
I can hear it. Oh, and yeah, that's Tom Bombadil again. And when you watch, oh, the scene, they finally included him. Immediately, why this character never made it into the Jackson version? For, like the book, he saves the hobbits from Old Man Willow, an evil tree spirit, which the Soviets interpreted as looking like this. It's a I think that was about three films or so ago. This is super low budget. And by that, I mean no budget. The actors weren't even paid. They just lived off their state-sanctioned salary. Soviet Union, remember? And despite being produced <laughs> by an official television network, it apparently was filmed in about <clears throat> nine hours. Yeah, they filmed... That's the gotta be a record. ...in less time than it would take to watch the Jackson trilogy. Why well, doesn't that surprise me? And given the technology of the time, it is no wonder it's so bad. Just look at Gandalf the Top the Eagle. Oh my god! And whenever there's an action scene, ah, no need to choreograph anything. Just slow down the footage and attack the cameraman. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with your screen, by the way. This is really what it looks like. And you might be thinking, scratchy DVD budget, quality. How on earth did they film the Balrog sequence? Well, spoiler alert, they didn't. So you might be like, what? So Gandalf lives then? No. He is what they do. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> he looks happy he's gone. <laughs> Oh well, move along. I mean, this special has to be seen to be believed. It makes Tommy was so low like Martin Scorsese. Just look at how they handle the mirror of Galadriel. <laughs> Okay, those were my subtitles, but believe me, I didn't realize how bad this was going into it. I thought, oh, the Russians did one teleplay, maybe this next one would be better. But oh lord, the design decisions in this alone made me want to call the police. Elrond looks like Matt Damon with a beard. Sam <laughs> is drawn on eyebrows. The innkeeper of the Prancing Pony looks like Saddam fucking Hussein. Mary looks huh. like a man in drag. It's <laughs> confusing because he's a man playing a man. And do you want to see what Gollum looks like? <laughs> yep, got room in face paint. That looks cabbages. better than the last guy. My cabbages! I could go on and on with this one. I mean, the barrel wines from the book get adapted here. <laughs> This is like. I'm very glad Jackson chose to admit them. God bless you, sir. This is like the most horrifying drag show of all time. This was actually thought lost for several years before Russian network 5TV decided to upload it to YouTube. So, if you do have a death wish, you can. Those Russians are sadistic. All its shitty glory. What more can I say than how fitting it is that this was made by the drunkest nation on the planet? Now we have <laughs> one more adaptation to look at, but before I get to it, it actually came to my attention when editing this video that the Soviets actually gave adapting The Hobbit yet another go. This time in cartoon form, with The Hobbit, Treasures Under the Mountain. And this one, by the looks of it, looks to be far superior to the other teleplays I've just talked about. There is, however, one tiny problem. This version was never finished. Yeah, remember how Guardians were shot around the collapse of the Soviet Union? Yeah, well, this was also produced around the same time. But given how the production of this one was likely going to take more than nine hours to complete, yeah, <laughs> its production studio couldn't possibly get it done in time. And before they knew it, oh shit, we're Russia now. As far as we know, only the six-minute prologue of this survives. And it's a shame, because the animation in this looks pretty decent. Actually does. Look, 
looks quite anime-esque, I think. Quite reminiscent of Japanese animation from the 80s. Now, there's really not much Possibly. to talk about with it. Most of it is just the guy narrating over Smaug's initial attack on Lake Town. So, it's difficult to form an opinion on it. But call me disappointed, at least, that the rest of this was never made. Because I would have liked to have seen where it went. <sighs> okay, so we're now on our last official adaptation. And for that, we're heading to Finland. For in 1993, they adapted Lord of the Rings into a nine-part miniseries called Hobbit. Huh! Oh, sorry. That almost seems Hobbit. appropriate. Translates as Hobbits, which is a fitting title, as this iteration chooses to only focus on Frodo and Sam's journey. All the events that Frodo and Sam aren't a part of are adapted, which makes sense given this is another low-budget offering. But is it low-quality? Well, we've looked at some shit today, with the live-action versions of Lord of the Rings really suffering. But out of the live-action versions pre-Jackson trilogy, this is the best one. It's still not very good, though. It's clear this is really hampered by its budget as well, because to save on costs, they have an older Sam tell the story. Yeah, this is supposed to be Sam. He looks more that like Prince's bride, Billy Crystal. True love is the greatest thing in the world. And oh. whenever there's a scene that would be too expensive to film, they instead just have Sam tell you what happened, whilst a bunch of incredibly bored-looking children listen to his story. Oh, and this is supposed to be The Shire, by the way. Why it looks so bloody dank and depressing, I don't know. In yeah, fact, that's this weird. This miniseries is dank and depressing. Everything looks so grim and lifeless, and you'll quickly notice that nearly all of this was shot on a blue screen. And whilst it is a competently keyed out blue screen this time, it's just depressing to never see a real life location. I mean, this is Finland. It's a like modern country. day filmmaking. Like New Zealand esque, actually. Why not take advantage of it? Even that shitty ass Soviet version sometimes shot on location. Not very well, mind you, but still. Now, the first major oddity I noticed in this version are the music choices. Because look, we're all familiar with the orchestral mastery of Howard Shaw. Sweeping, beautiful orchestras. God damn, Lord of the Rings wouldn't be nearly as good without that man's work. But for Hobbit Tit, what genre of music do they use for the soundtrack? Jazz. Slow, sexy, sax-heavy huh? jazz. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting Angel Heart vibes. I mean, come on, this isn't Lord of the Rings. The only way this soundtrack would be fitting is if you put Frank German in it. Watch! Her hair was the color of gold <laughs> painting. <laughs> he was giving me a look I could feel in my hip pocket. And when he doesn't go to Jackson, and it's Frank Drebin. so unfitting. Like, remember the incredibly disturbing but brilliant scene of Smeagol killing Deagle? In the Jackson version, it is so unsettling to watch. But here, the soundtrack makes it sound like it's played for laughs. <laughs> the acting doesn't help. Oops. He just strangled <laughs> his beloved cousin to death. Silly speaker, what the hell are you doing? Silly <laughs> Silly Go f yourself! <laughs> to this special's credit, it does do some things well. Considering its budget, the acting is pretty good. I actually think Gandalf's pretty cool in this. And it is the best live action adaptation of Tom Bombadil out there. Even though is that even like possible? For some reason. But the unironic highlight of this series has got to be when they get to the Prancing Pony, where Frodo gets up to do a song and dance number, which, by the way, the Bakshi version also does this. But here, the song is actually amazing. <laughs> Maybe in Finland it's amazing. Not convinced? Well, check out this bit where Frodo hypes up the violinist to do a solo. Alright, I like a good violin solo. Get it? How does a show go from making the worst musical decisions ever to giving us this banger? Oh, we gotta get back to the plot. Oh. 
Okay, but what about Gollum in this one? Well, he is definitely uh, better portrayed here than well, any of the other live-action adaptations. I can roll with it. But it is still weird to see a grown-ass man playing him. <laughs> <laughs> a lot fatter, which maybe goes against him. I mean, credit to the actor. He's really going for it. But I just don't think Gollum can be portrayed well without some sort of visual effects at play. And if for one second you think this is a good portrayal of Gollum, you haven't seen this bit. I'm going to make it. I'm going to Oh, God, oh, God. Oh, God. Whoa. <laughs> Why would you do that? Shake your ass. I'm speaking of assaults on the eyes. The effects in this one are... Weird. I mean, some are handled well enough. Yeah, that was actually one of the good effects. But remember how in the 1991 Soviet version, they just skipped the fight with the Balrog and had Gandalf die off screen? Well, would you believe me when I say that this version handles that moment even worse? Because here, Gandalf tells the Fellowship to flee, and then he just trips and falls down a hole. Keep watching. Seriously? It worse. Oh! Talk about what? fuck you. There's another falling scene in Lord of the Rings, isn't there? When Gollum falls into the lava. Yep, they use that same effect again. Spinning ass. Why add the spinning effect? They're falling, not flushing. Yeah, flush. <laughs> And yeah, the lack of budget is clearly evident in other parts. From the asphalt off the chase scene being skipped, to Galadriel only showing up as a shitty reflection, to Shelob's attack awkwardly being handled off screen, to these god awful butt effects, cause lord forbid we hire a fucking canoe for a couple hours. And the looks of the characters are weird too. When Gandalf shows up at the end, his skin is blue for some reason. He's a zombie. And who needs a hair department when you can just buy a shitload of wigs? You get a wig. You get a wig. You get a wig. It looks like that guy's in blackface. Oh, oh, you don't get a wig. <laughs> That's a very interesting haircut choice for Middle Earth. Who the hell is this character? Wait, is that supposed to be fucking Boromir? Okay, so Boromir <laughs> in this has a side cut and he's rocking a snake tattoo on his head. Definitely bloody fits the angsty ride. personality. That off. He's wielded a goddamn katana sword. I, I, I don't think that's... War of the Rings I meets think Highlander. Think anything that that katana belongs to that actor. <laughs> So yeah, I was hopeful this last one would be good. But with the Jackson trilogy out there, there is no reason to watch this. Okay, there's one reason. I want to go to a Lord of the Rings concert one day where they play this. The violin is good. I'll give it that. that. Ladies and gentlemen, is every on-screen adaptation of The Lord of the Rings in the 20th century. Of course, after Jackson's trilogy, there are more versions. A couple of fan films here and there, Tolkien himself got a biopic, and of course there was the recent Rings of Power series on Amazon, which gets a lot of flack, but given what I've seen in this video, I have a much greater appreciation for it. Much love to everyone who clicked on this video and stuck around to the end. I've got more videos like this. There's my name. Subscribe if you're new, and consider supporting me on Patreon if you really dig the video. And if you're watching this, that must mean you are a patron. Thank you guys especially. Let me thank my top tier patrons by name. And their names are Ryan Massey, Chef Matt Reviews, Dr. Ten, Mark Tonner, Gregorio Vasquez, Max Stahl, Goldsbro TSG, Jake, Ewan Hurst, Jake Matthew Crawford, Christian Lishka, and Stefan Sujibu. Look, well, there's a guy just Thanks called episode, Jake guys, before me. Till next time, Namarie. Okay, so that was the Unusual Suspects video on all the pre Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings adaptations, and I was really excited for this video. Really wanted to see all the ones that I was not familiar with. Um, 
Welcome back. I did know that there was a Russian version of The Hobbit, but I completely fucking forgot about it. And again, I was only familiar with the animated ones from Rankin Bask and Bakshi. So, uh, it's cool to hear him cover it all, and there were a lot of funny jokes. I love the inclusions of, like, Tommy Wiseau, just his reactions, his green screen skits. You know, he reenacted connecting to just, like, the laugh from Denethor. Yeah, there was a lot here I enjoyed, and it's cool to see he has a good big list of the supporters at the end, and took some notes, so let's go through, like, re-go through the adaptations quickly. Um, the, <laughs> the fact about the Beatles wanting to make a Lord of the Rings, um, that was surprising, and the idea of John Lennon as Gollum, that would be worth the goddamn price of admission. Uh, but the 1967 12-minute Hobbit, um, yeah, that just looks... And the later Soviet stuff might make it look not quite as cheap, but yeah, that looks really fucking cheap. And his joke about the guy, one of the producers being Adolf Born, yeah, that's quite an unfortunate name. I liked him including the Leonard Nimoy song, where he belts out... Bilbo Bilbo Baggins. Sagan on Ringon from Sweden. The one I said was from 1971. That looked pretty fucking dumb. Looked pretty incompetent with its half animated, half live action, and him saying it's just a bunch of people chatting. And uh, the Rankin Bass Hobbit. Well, it is short. I don't know if it feels rushed. Um, I remember watching it as a little kid and feeling like it uh, went by at a reasonable pace and I could follow it. I do think, yeah, Gollum is a... Uh, it's different than Andy Serkis, but that was the, my, that was my original Gollum and uh, seemed like a good creepy fuck. But yeah, I do agree. Bilbo can be a bit too whimsical and uh, whining how he talks, but the Hobbits have always been like that. And my biggest parting of opinions is him thinking that there's way too much music and again I will admit I'm probably biased because I grew up with these animated films and my family they all love the end of songs in fact um, I think my mom owns a record of the Hobbit soundtrack yeah I, I like the songs a lot I, they get me in a good mood so, I, I completely disagree, but A, they're not for everybody, and I do, I can see how for some people, having these songs in Lord of the Rings would probably be kind of weird. But anyway, the Ralph Bakshi film, I remember seeing it and just thinking that it was interesting, but weird, just because it has so much, but also doesn't have so much of what we saw in the Peter Jackson films, and... I agree, having it not be continued to Return of the King feels like a real fucking cop-out. And I do agree, the rotoscoping can look really uh, nauseating at times. The faces are very kicked in the head by a horse looking. Editing, yeah, can be a bit weird. Pacing, I do agree that Gandalf falling off the bridge is much better handled here, while in Fellowship it was just so fucking retarded how he just hung there for like half a minute and nobody went out to try and help him. And the 1980 Rankin Bass version, um, yeah, maybe if I didn't, didn't grow up seeing it, I could see how it's skipping Fellowship and the Two Towers would be a bit off-putting, but again, I can all, I saw it when I was little without ever having seen anything related to Two Towers or Fellowship, so I was able to get into it and follow it pretty well. Maybe I'm alone in that, but I just got into it. And my, maybe, maybe the fact that my mom was there to like fill in some of the blanks helped, but I like the Rankin Bass Return of the King. It had some different takes on some stuff that I thought worked. Um, I don't think it doesn't make sense. Uh, again, I respectfully disagree on with the usual suspect on the songs. To me, the Return of the King, like a lot, of my family really loves the Hobbit songs, but for me, the Return of the King soundtrack is where it all is. And some parts, again, are not as strong as the Jackson films. He says it's a bit all over the place. Some parts can feel that way. 
I will agree, King Theoden's death, looking back on it, is, um, pretty fucking silly. And as for, let's see, um, the fabulous Hobbit, that just looks, um, I don't know, maybe all the Soviet stuff will blend in, but the fabulous Hobbit, as he said, looks like it'd be fun to take the piss out of. The goblin stuff was really, uh... Really a bit of a cheap out. It's like when Star Trek couldn't afford, the original Star Trek couldn't afford makeup for the Klingons. They just had them being looking like humans. Guardians, uh, the other Soviet Hobbit. Uh, the green screen looks awful. The firework effect, I agree, looks just um, um, dumbfounding. And I'm trying not to repeat the same things over and over, but I'm doing this at a pretty late hour, so might be running on fumes here. The Shadow Puppets, <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, good to laugh at bit, just how dumb it is. It's weird to see a Lord of the Rings adaptation that actually has Tom Bombadil in it. And that whole filmed in nine hours shit, uh, I, all I can say is, Roger Corman, eat your heart out. And as for The Hobbit, Treasure Under the Mountain, the animation does look pretty good. And, well, I'm in love with the Rankin-Bass Hobbit, I think that could have been interesting to see if they had ever been able to complete it. And who knows, maybe they could. A movie River Phoenix film, but couldn't complete when he died. They were able to complete that, um, like 25 years after it was made. And the Finland nine-hour miniseries, Hobbit Tit, I think that's what he said, also looks very cheap. There's just so much green screen, like, I, I guess, yeah, there's no other way they could really pull off Middle Earth, aside from going to, like, Jackson, New Zealand. But, uh, it's amazing how awful the green screen looks in some of these adaptations. I'm, I'm not really into some of the uh, music, but I, I will concede the violin stuff is really good. Like, I, I got a soft spot for the violin. The slow jazz is just bizarre. Um, and Gollum, well, the guy does seem to be going for the crazy. I'm not sure a uh, thick, fat Gollum works. The ass crack definitely fits, but I'm not sure the body shape really goes with him. The Smeagol scene where he kills his cousin, there's no real weight to that from what I saw here. That's all I really have to say. I enjoyed this. I laughed. Probably came off a little obnoxious at times. Sorry about that. But uh, I enjoyed this and as always I love to react to the usual suspect. He's very encouraging of people reacting to his work so if you haven't seen some of his other reviews, uh, I recommend checking them out. Maybe do a reaction. I'm sure he'd be open to it, and I'm filming this very, very fucking late. Um, and when I'm filming late, I would get a little uh, jittery, a little, um, little jumpy, but either way, this was a lot of fun as a Lord of the Rings fan, and I will see you again hopefully soon.